Welcome to section 2.12. We're going to discuss transport now. Uh, we're going to start off by talking about kind of the simpler version of transport, if you will. Uh, that's going to be diffusion, which is going to be a type of passive transport. And so this will be something where you'll take a bunch of particles that are kind of smashed together initially, and we're going to have them kind of spread out. They're going to basically, you know, move away from each other until they're about equally dispersed in whatever it is that you're talking about. Uh, this is not going to be specific to cells, so you guys will have seen diffusion in everyday life where someone can put lotion on their hands and you'll see the smell radiate, or perhaps they did something that smells that's not quite as pleasant, but you'll see that the scent kind of just spreads gradually. And this will be because these particles that you have, so in this case these initial crammed together particles, are all moving. They're all bouncing around in different directions, so they're kind of randomly shifting all over the place. And because of this, as they keep bouncing and bouncing, they eventually tend to spread apart about equally. Now, biological transport, biological diffusion, is a little bit more interesting because we can have membranes in the way. And so not all things will be able to just pass through the membrane. And so in some cases you can have where if there's a barrier here, you won't be able to actually get to the other side. These guys could spread out over here, but they can't necessarily get anywhere they want. So diffusion through the air, through the water, this is going to happen normally in everyday life. This happens with just about everything. But for biological diffusion, we're normally going to be talking about membranes. Now, for a kind of a really quick prep for transport, uh, when we talk about cellular transport, there's going to be a couple different types. And so we're going to have passive and active. So we can kind of think of it where there's two pathways that we can take. If you go the passive route, it's going to involve diffusion, which means that we're going to go from where there's a lot of something, so essentially a high concentration, to where there's less of something, so low. Whereas active transport is going to be something where we go from an area of low concentration, and we're going to move to somewhere where there's a higher concentration. So we're trying to corral things together, smash things together. If we talk about these as well, you'll see active transport is ultimately going to use energy, so this will require ATP, whereas passive transport, whoops, if I can not screw things up, uh, but whereas passive transport, if I can write ATP, uh, will not require ATP. This does not need energy. So we've got kind of our pathways of passive transport, which will be diffusion, or active transport, which can either be these guys called pumps that we'll learn about later, or through vesicles either way would still be considered active. Passive and diffusion, these guys are going to get rid of a gradient, they're going to spread things out, whereas active transport, pumps and vesicles, these guys will oftentimes cram things together. So what is diffusion? We've kind of discussed here this idea that we've got gradients, and so because we have gradients, we've kind of discussed this fact that, oops, as I select my pen, uh, we've discussed this fact that we can have highs and we can have lows. And so in this case, you can see in this scenario, we have a high concentration initially that's going to be on the left, and we have a semi-permeable membrane. That's important, because if these particles can't get through the membrane, they can't balance this out. They'd have to stay balanced out on just the left-hand side. They couldn't move over to the right. But because they can in this case, you're going to see these particles, as they're bouncing, will tend to bounce through here until we eventually get where it's balanced. Now this will take some amount of time, depending on some other factors we'll talk about later, but eventually we will get where these guys are kind of equally dispersed as they move around, because they went from high to low. And you'll notice this just happens, because we don't need to input energy. This is not something where I have to go through and provide something for this to occur. Diffusion just happens. And so we don't, in some cases it can be negative because it's harder to control, you know, it, it, if it just occurs, you have to be very careful if you want to avoid it. But if you want this to happen, you don't have to really worry too much. It just occurs. So long as there's a gradient, and so long as the particles can move, you will get diffusion that will happen. And so this occurs with just about any substance. The only trick is you have to make sure that if there's a membrane involved, that the membrane will allow them to pass. Just like I could have two rooms and put everybody in one room. Now those people might want to spread out over the two rooms, but if there's a wall there, if they can't access the other room, they can't spread out. So they would stay clumped together. Now they might spread out within the room, but they would still stay relatively clumped together because they couldn't access the other side. 
So that's why in biology it's important that we have some means, if you want diffusion to occur, for these guys to pass through to the other side. And then this process here we have is called dynamic equilibrium. And this is kind of the end point of diffusion where things are equally spaced out. Now the idea of dynamic equilibrium, the dynamic part, is that they're still moving. You can see here these particles are moving, moving, moving. They started all kind of up in the corner here, but they're going to keep bouncing and bouncing and that makes them become spread out. Now this part where they're spread out but still moving is dynamic equilibrium, where on average they're about as spread out as they're going to get. You know, at any given moment you might have some spots you can see where there's fewer balls right there, but if you wait you'll see that some more will come through and bounce there anyway. So overall, on average, these are about as spread out as they're going to get. So dynamic equilibrium, that's what you're seeing. If we put a membrane here, the semi-permeable membrane that I drew badly, you'd also see that some of them still would bounce to the other side, but you'd also have an equal number roughly that bounce back. And so overall, you'd still have about the same number of particles on either side, but they'd still be moving. So it's like having a room where you allow one, like a club or something, where if 10 people leave, 10 people can enter. So overall, things stay pretty constant, but they're still moving. It's not like you locked in the people that are there for the rest of the night. And this will be affected by several things. We've talked about these guys are moving and bouncing off of each other to make this happen. So it's molecular motion and molecular contact that allows for these guys to just end up spread out. You know, they don't think this through. They just end up, by random bouncing in motion, they end up about as far away from each other as they can get. And so one way we can make this go faster is to make the particles move faster. And so there's several ways for that. You could go through and increase the temperature. If I increase the temperature, particles will get faster. And so that means this process will just occur quicker. No big deal. Uh, it's kind of like going through and saying run instead of walk. You're going to get there faster. You might get there anyway, but you'll do it faster. Uh, the other way we can do this is sometimes we can actually increase the number of particles themselves and so that can allow for there to be more collisions in the first place which can help them spread out a bit better so we can up the amount of things. Uh, so that's another way that we can ultimately get this process to occur faster. We can also help the movement ourselves, where you can do things like stirring. And so if you've ever tried to make like Kool-Aid or something else, you notice that it'll work faster if you help move the particles. So it's not just random molecular motion and atomic motion. You're actually helping out by stirring or shaking it. You're helping to make those collisions happen faster more often to let them kind of push apart quicker. So there's a variety of things, it's just some of them, that will affect how fast this occurs. So it's not just you know going to be the fixed rate no matter what. Uh, you'll see also with this idea of diffusion, it's going to be a relatively slow process over large distances. And so diffusion works really well as long as you only want things to move a relatively short distance. But if you ever think about when someone sprays a scent and how long it can take for it to cross a room, and that's in a wide open room, you know, that's an air where particles typically have pretty free motion. So they can, you know, spread pretty rapidly. And even there it can take seconds or even minutes for things to travel uh, a decent sized distance, but not huge. So if we scale this down and you think about like oxygen going through your skin, trying to get inside your body into like cells that are in the middle of your arm, with those being solids and those particles not being as easy to move large distances, it can take an exceedingly long time for that to happen. And so that's why most animals, especially big animals, we have special surfaces to allow for diffusion, like in our lungs, uh, to occur where our lungs have a lot of surface area. They're all folded up into these sacs and everything else. And then it allows for short distance diffusion into our blood. So it's only going just a tiny distance, like you know, one cell, two cells. And once it's in our blood, then we'll carry it elsewhere by pumping the heart. You know, we're not waiting for it to diffuse elsewhere. We're actively going to move it there. And you will see that very few animals, unless they're really thin and relatively small, will actually just rely on diffusion to provide them with their needs because it's just too slow. So biologically it's important, biologically it happens, but biologically it's not going to be the main source of transport that most organisms will use for everything. Hope you guys enjoyed this and I'll see you soon.